My name is Justin Francis. I'm blessed to serve as one of the shepherds and elders of this great church, New Life Community Church in Bridgeport. And I greet you in the mighty and matchless name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. He is risen. Amen. Can I get an amen in those comments? (laughs) And we celebrate the resurrection, not just on Resurrection Day or Easter, but each and every day of our lives. Because the resurrection, Lord, of our Lord, the resurrection, it gives us and sustains us with the power that we need to go day by day. Today, we're continuing in our series that we started last week entitled Upwards. It's entitled Upwards, God's truth to build up our relationships. And we're in a time, as we all know, during COVID-19, where many people are sick. Some have died. Uh, People are panicking. So many people are are scared and, and confused about what's going on in the world. But I'm here today today to encourage you, brothers and sisters, that COVID-19 has not caught our God by surprise. It surprised all of us, but God has a plan. And the word of God says that all things work together for the good of the call for those who know our Lord. So we encourage you by God's grace to stand firm in the faith, to not live in fear, but to look upwards. Amen. Now, for some of us during COVID-19 that are stuck at home, We're around our spouses a lot more than usual. And so we need God's help in order to not get tired of them, if we're honest. It's tough being stuck at home with your spouse at times. Then for another group of us, we have our children at home. Now some of us have been forced to be homeschool teachers (laughs) unexpectedly, and we're on the brink of insanity at times, stuck in our house, you know, during this time. Then for another group of us, Some of us who live by ourselves, who live alone, we might be struggling with loneliness. You know, during normal times, you could go to your favorite part of the city, go to your favorite restaurant. Maybe you could connect with friends and family. You could leave the house, you know, go to church and fellowship with your brothers and sisters. And now you find yourself alone and maybe even depressed. We have to look upwards and also use up words, words that build up and edify each other at this time so that we could still love one another even when we're stuck at home with one another. And we're gonna encourage you today from the book of Ephesians, no matter what situation you find yourself in, whether it's with your children, your spouse, or you're by yourself, we have to look up to find God's truth. And today, God's word is going to teach us and we're gonna learn from this text in Ephesians chapter four that God calls his people to repentance. He calls us to bless others with what we have and to build one another up with uncorrupted speech. Once again, God calls his people to repentance, to bless others with what we have and to build one another up with uncorrupted speech. Our text today is coming from Ephesians chapter four, verse 28 and 29. Join me in the text, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28 and 29. Verse 28 says this, Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. In verse 29, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. We honor the word of God by saying amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your truth. We thank you that we can look up in the midst of pandemic and disaster. We look to the hills from whence cometh our help. Our help comes from the Lord. Our help comes from you, Lord, and only you. Thank you for all those who are watching on the live stream, Lord. I pray if someone here does not know you watching today, that they will surrender and bow the knee to your majesty, your glory, that they will repent and trust in you. And for the believers today, I pray they're encouraged by everything that is said through your word, by your power. In Christ Jesus name we pray. Amen. Last week, Luke taught us from the book of Ephesians about how we can speak truth and react in different situations in life without displaying sinful anger. We're human beings after all, we're not robots, we have emotions, we have feelings. 
Sometimes the way we react to certain things, we don't even understand the way we react. Sometimes you, you know, go through something and something jumps out of you and like, wow, where did that come from? But as believers, we have the Holy Spirit. We have God's word that helps and teaches us how to display anger without sinning, because the book of Ephesians does teach us that we can be angry and not sin. Unfortunately, many people misquote Jesus and they say, if you're angry, you're a murderer. Or if you're angry, you're in danger of judgment. But, but let's stop and think about that claim. <laughs> Jesus himself became angry, did he not? When he dealt with the merchants in the temple, he turned over tables and he cleansed the temple. Jesus was angry himself. So being angry in and of itself cannot be a sin because that would have meant that Jesus sinned. And we know that Jesus never sinned. He was the perfect, sinless, stainless lamb of God, God in the flesh, fully God and fully man. However, this is what Jesus actually taught. Jesus taught us that being angry without a cause is what puts us in danger in Matthew chapter five. And then the Bible also says that if you hate somebody, you hate your brother, you're a murderer. So there's a sinful anger, but then there's a righteous anger. And the Bible says, be angry and do not sin in the book of Ephesians. So we can display a righteous anger when we see sin in our world, when we see injustice in our world. We should get angry at these things when we see what's going on. There should be a righteous indignation that rises up inside of us. However, when we get so angry that we actually desire to harm somebody else, that's when it becomes sinful. So we have to guard against an ungodly anger. And last week, we also learned a pretty easy to remember, biblically derived catchphrase. And that phrase was, you do what you do because you are who you are. You do what you do because you are who you are. Where do you find your identity? Who defines your identity? In Ephesians 4, chapter 17, in Ephesians 4, verse 17, Paul teaches us that as God's chosen people, that is our new identity. We no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility or error of our mind. We no longer walk in the emptiness of our mind because we have a new identity. And what we do now is because of who we are in Christ. We're new creations now. We don't walk as the people who do not know God. We as Christians, we don't live in sensuality. We don't live in deceitful speech. We hate sin and we fight sin as we continue to make Jesus Lord of our lives. And that is an interesting concept, making Jesus Lord of your lives. Now, why do I say that? I'm glad you asked. Because Jesus is already Lord of our lives, even before we're saved, because he's the only true and living God. So when we say we make Jesus Lord of our lives, what we're saying is we surrender every single area and aspect of our lives to the Lordship of Jesus. Jesus is Lord of the Christians, but Jesus is also Lord of the Muslims. Jesus is Lord of the Buddhists. Jesus is Lord of the Hebrew Israelites. Jesus is Lord of the Mormons. Jesus is Lord of the atheists. Even the atheists have to bow the knee to Jesus because the Bible says that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So when we make him Lord, it's not that he wasn't Lord already. We're just recognizing his lordship, that he calls the shots in our lives, that he tells us what's right and wrong, and we submit to his law and his order. He is Lord of every area of our existence. The only true God that exists is the God of the Bible, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is Lord of all creation and of the universe. Now let's look at verse 28 of Ephesians chapter four once again. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. When we come to Christ, God commands and expects us to change. But the amazing thing about the God of the Bible is that he doesn't say you need to change and he walks away and leaves us alone. No, God commands us to change, but then he equips us and gives us every single thing we need to actually change. He gives us his Holy Spirit, which regenerates us and gives us a new heart, new mind, new desires. 
but he gives us the word of God to live out each and every day. And he gives us the body of Christ. So God commands you to change, but then he equips you to make it actually happen. That's something else that separates the God of the Bible from other religions. Other religions say you need to change or you need to do this and that. And they leave you to try your best with your own effort to make it happen. But know the God of the Bible gives us everything we need to please him and to turn away from sin. Repentance is a command and it's changing your mind and turning away from sin. But it's only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't change on our own. We can't repent on our own. Repentance is a gift. Unfortunately, there's a common false doctrine amongst many Christians in, a, in many churches and it's called antinomianism, antinomianism. So what exactly is antinomianism? It comes from two Greek words. The first word, anti, meaning against, and namas, meaning law. So it's against law. So this era, what it basically comes down to is this. This era teaches that there are no laws for Christians to follow that God has no real moral standard for us to live by. People who adhere to this false doctrine, they say, all you have to do is to believe, just believe. You don't have to live in holiness. You don't need to repent. Repentance is a work is what they say. But that's a lie. They say repentance is works based. No, repentance is a command. And when you repent, it's only by God's power that you can repent. But the Bible says that without holiness, no man will see God. And if your view clearly contradicts the rest of scripture, then you know you need to reject it. Repentance and a changed life is evidence of the Holy Spirit. We have Galatians 5 with the fruit of the Spirit. Another name for antinomianism is easy believism. The late great pastor and theologian R.C. Sproul, he says this about antinomianism. He says, easy believism is a modern form of the ancient heresy of antinomianism. It asserts that once a person makes a decision for Christ or prays to receive Jesus as Savior, it is not necessary to embrace him as Lord. Adherents of antinomianism, they believe there's no requirements of law that bind the Christian. However, does that view work with our passage today? Does that view work with the book of Ephesians? Does that view work with the rest of the Bible and what Jesus taught? No, my friends, it does not. Not at all. Once again, let's look at our text. Verse 28 of Ephesians chapter four. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. This text here paints a clear picture of repentance. It says anyone, not those who are mature in the faith, not those who have been saved for 25 years. No, anyone, anyone who has believed in Christ, steal no longer. Stop stealing. Stop taking things that God has not given you. If God is not giving you something and you want it and you steal it, what you're saying is, God, you're not good. You don't know what's best for me. I need to take it into my own hands. So I'm a steal. I'm going to go out on my own. I'm not going to trust your sovereign plan that you haven't given me this for a certain reason. We don't always know the reason why God doesn't do what we want, but he's God. His ways are higher than our ways. The Bible says as far as the heavens are from the earth are so God's ways so high above man's ways. And I struggle with that myself. There are certain things I want from God, but what we can't do is go and steal to get what we want because God is not giving you whatever you're asking for, for a reason. So the solution is not to go out and try to take it by your own means. In the original language of Ephesians, Koine Greek, the word used here is a present active imperative. That's kind of deep, but the reason I go to the original language is this. The meaning is you must not steal or you better stop stealing. In the original language, that's how it's rendered. Stop stealing. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. Paul's not saying, well, you know, stop stealing if you could, you know, come around to not stealing. Please, you know, just don't steal. No, stop. Stop stealing. You must stop stealing. It's a command. This is something that God tells us we must not do anymore. We must work doing things useful with our hands, using the skills and gifts that God has given us in order to honor him. 
And if we struggle and we fall short to obey God, that's one thing. But if we clearly see what God's word commands and we say we don't care, we ain't worried about what the word of God has to say. We need to start questioning if we even know God. Are you even saved? If you see what God's word clearly commands and you say, nah, I'm going to do my own thing. How can you say you know God? How can you say you love God? Look at what Jesus said about people with that attitude. Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then in John 14, 21, he says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one that loves me. He didn't say whoever just says they believe and they repeat a sinner's prayer. That's who loves me or whoever just says they love me but they live as if I don't exist are the ones who love you. He said, no, those who keep my words and do what I say are the ones who love me. He didn't say those who walk perfectly and never make a mistake. No, but those who keep his word, those who strive to honor and please God, those are the ones who love him. If I continuously disobey my mom or my dad, my parents, but I say I love them, you're going to look at me crazy. Why would how could I love someone who I continuously to ignore and act like they don't exist? I continuously disobey them. That's not love, my friends. Please don't be deceived by antinomianism. There is a standard that God has given us, the commands of Jesus. So we see here a command to stop stealing. But as believers, we don't just stop stealing. We stop any sinful action that we were doing before we knew the Lord. We repent of sex outside of marriage. We repent of homosexual sin. We repent of racism. We repent of lying, cheating, violence, theft, and any other sin. And the fact of the matter is this about repentance. Repentance is twofold. Repentance involves stopping your negative and sinful actions and replacing them with godly positive actions. Once again, repentance is twofold. It involves stopping your negative and sinful actions and replacing them with godly, positive actions. And this is all by the power of the Holy Spirit. We as Christians, New Testament Christians, New Covenant, Second Covenant believers, we submit to the law of Christ. No, we're not under the Mosaic law. When I say that we submit to the law, I'm not saying we're under the over 600 laws of Moses. Though the Ten Commandments is still the moral law, we are under the law of Christ. We look at the teachings of Christ and we follow those teachings as Christ has come to the earth. We are saved by simply believing the gospel. We're saved by grace alone through faith alone. We can't add to anything Jesus has done and we can't take away from anything Jesus has done. However, the fruit of genuine salvation has always been and will always be repentance and obedience. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection gave us everything we need to be justified before God. But the fruit of justification or sanctification comes through repentance and obedience and every single day relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. And we see that in our passage today. By God's power, after we stop living in our past sins, God then wants us to live in such a way that our honest labor translates into sharing with others who are in need. There are no gifts, please listen closely, there are no gifts or abilities that God has given you simply for your own benefit. No, 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 no. God also, God always wants us to bless others in need. He hasn't given you your gifts simply to make your life better. Now, yes, we can earn a living through our gifts. We, we, we can become wealthy through our gifts. There's nothing wrong with wealth when it's used for God's glory and it's not motivated by greed. However, God opens those doors primarily for his glory and for the benefit of his kingdom. Now, let's look at verse 29 of our text. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. We as believers, we're called and commanded to cease corrupt and evil speech. We are called to repent of rotten speech that negatively influences people. And we are to substitute that speech with, build, with speech that builds up others according to their needs and benefits the listener. With our words, we can build up and bless or we can curse and corrupt which one will you do? 
And that's different for everybody. There's different views of cussing. There's different views of evil speech. But speech that puts other people down, some of those sexual jokes that we make, we need to be careful. We need to speak in such a way that builds up the body of Christ instead of tearing each other down. Uncorrupted speech, speech that's not rotten and putrid. In the original language, some of the words used here are words that are like rotten fish. They smell bad. They're a putrid odor. That's the type of speech that we need to avoid as believers. And today, I believe that through this text, God wants to teach us that God calls his people to repentance, to bless others with what we have, and to build up one another with uncorrupted speech. Once again, God calls his people to repentance, to bless others with what we have, and to build one another up with uncorrupted speech. Now, how can we live this text out? Before we get to verse 28 of Ephesians 4, verse 27 gives us some amazing advice. It says this, give no opportunity to the devil. And in other translations, this verse says, don't give the devil a foothold in our lives. And that's very important because many of our sinful actions actually open the door for Satan to destroy our families, our lives, and our Christian testimony. We have to remember we have an enemy out there that we can give a foothold to if we're not careful with the way we speak, and with the way we live. So today I wanna to leave you with five ways that we can practice living an upwards lifestyle. Five ways that we can practice living an upwards lifestyle. Number one, the first way we could practice living an upwards lifestyle is to pray before you make big decisions. And when you're angry, stop to pray and ask the Lord to remove any satanic footholds from your mind. Sometimes we have a big decision in front of us and it could cause us stress and also anger. But when we feel those emotions of anger, I encourage you, stop. Before you make that big decision, before you act out on that anger, stop and pray to God and say, Lord, protect me from this being a satanic foothold. Stop and examine what's going on to see if Satan might be trying to use that situation as a foothold in your life. So pray before big decisions and when angry, stop and pray and ask the Lord to remove any satanic footholds from your mind. Number two, the second way that we can live an upwards lifestyle is to contact two or more seasoned saints who can hold you accountable so that you do not fall into sins of the past or to help you with present temptations. Now, why do I say two or more? See, some people, they say, well, I got an accountability partner. I'm good. But I encourage you, you need more than one person to hold you accountable. You know why? What if that person passes away or they get sick or maybe denies the faith? I've had close friends who walk away from the Lord. And if all I had to depend on was them in my time of need, I would have been messed up. So I encourage you, get two or more seasoned brothers or sisters in the faith that can hold you accountable with sins of the past or with present temptation. Number three, the third way we could practice living an upwards lifestyle. Stop watching TV shows, movies, or listening to music that contains corrupt talk. <laughs> if you notice these negative influences spilling into your everyday life, your everyday speech, and your everyday interactions, then you know you need to let go of them. Now, we do have Christian liberty. Some Christians can watch a certain movie, listen to certain types of music, and it doesn't spill over into other areas of their lives, and it doesn't really affect them the same way. But other people, they can't see certain images. They can't watch certain movies. So each Christian has to make that choice for themselves, and you know what level of maturity you are at. But overall, if it contains corrupt talk, we need to be careful. Some of us need to let go of certain movies, certain types of music that pollutes us and contains this rotten and corrupted speech. Reason number four, fourth way we can live an upwards lifestyle. Separate yourself from people who constantly bring you down with corrupt speech. You know those people in your life, every time you get around them, there's gossip, there's evil speech, negative, negative, negative Nancy all the time, right? 
Separate yourself from those type of people. Or if you don't want to separate yourself, at least confront corrupt talkers in love, grace and humility. Confront them. Maybe you tell them this. Hey, I love you, but either you have to change how you speak or I can't be around you anymore. So either separate yourself from corrupt talkers or confront them. Tell them you need to repent. This isn't right. And the final way that we can practice living an upwards lifestyle from Ephesians chapter 4, 28 and 29. If you are the one practicing corrupt speech, confess it to a few of your brothers and sisters in Christ and forsake that corrupt speech today. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's not the other people around you who are doing corrupt talk. Maybe you're the one who's negatively influencing other people with the way you speak. Today, if that's you, I challenge you to repent of that, to do that no longer, and to ask God through his Holy Spirit, Lord, bless my speech, change my speech today. I don't want to be a corrupt speaker no more. I don't want to have on wholesome talk in my mouth anymore. Make sure that you also have people hold you accountable who are not corrupt talkers themselves. It's no good to be around people who are doing the same thing you're doing. Get around some people who aren't corrupt speakers themselves. And like I said, more than one person. In closing today, we're now going to give you an opportunity if you're watching to pray to God and to connect with him. If you're an unbeliever, drop a comment in our live stream right now. Drop a comment whether you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook and tell somebody so we can connect with you to share the gospel with you, that Jesus Christ died and rose again to free you from sin and you could be saved today. Repent and trust in Christ Jesus. Maybe you're a believer today struggling with fear or anxiety. We ask you also to drop a comment so that we can pray with you, so that we can walk you through these trying times. Once again, God is not caught by surprise by COVID-19. And in his time, he's going to bring deliverance, whether that's in this life or one day in heaven. But either way, this won't last forever. And we're giving you the hope of the gospel that we need to be saved from sin more than we need to be saved from COVID-19. And today I encourage you to trust in Christ alone because God calls his people to repentance, to bless others with what we have and to build one another up with uncorrupted speech. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you've equipped us on how to honor you with our speech. You've equipped us on how to live the Christian life. Lord, I pray you bless everyone listening to this sermon today, Lord. And in this time of pandemic and disaster, I pray for peace and healing to those watching. I pray that you take away COVID-19, Lord, and I pray for our government leaders, our president, Lord, our mayor, Lord, the different senators and governors all around the country, all the different leaders around the world. I pray for the world. I pray for the church, Lord, to continue to rise up, to love their communities and also to share and preach the gospel. I pray for unbelievers that they'll be saved. And I pray for the church to continue to rise up at this time. And we praise you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And we praise you for all these things. And we believe that you're going to move on our behalf, Lord. We thank you in Yeshua, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.